what um, I'm supposed to do here, and what I'm going to try to do, is Jesse and Matt and Matt and Victor have gone through a whole bunch of different you know, mechanics and methods and applications. And in applying a lot of this stuff, there are a bunch of nuts and bolts and knobs that you have to turn and choices that have to be made. And what I want to do is kind of walk through some examples to illustrate some of this stuff in some real data sets. So how would you actually turn some of these knobs and what choices do you really have to make? And, you know, hopefully get across some of what would actually be involved in doing this. Um, I want to be perfectly clear that everything I'm going to talk about are meant as illustrative examples. Okay? Uh, at no point am I going to present anything like novel in terms of, wow, this is a brand new research thing that you should be interested in. Um, hopefully you'll find the examples mildly interesting anyway. All right. Um, and then along those lines, these are all examples taken from other papers. All of these examples have identifying assumptions. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but that's not what I'm talking. I'm going to condition on those guys who thought carefully about these problems actually having done a good job doing that and those identifying assumptions actually making sense in the context we're looking at. And I want to just talk about sort of what the stuff we've been doing for the last couple of days could bring to these handful of examples. All right, and how you could have applied those things in these examples. All right, um, and I think importantly, before I actually get into this, you need to remember all this high dimensional stuff we've been talking about as economists should be hopefully thought of as ways to complement your economic intuition, complement the things that you're doing, um, not replace them. Okay? All the stuff that you always think about, how do I identify this? What things do I have to control for? Where is the source of variation? You still have to do all that. You can't just say, oh, they've got these nice, beautiful model selection procedures and they'll do everything for me and I don't have to worry about that. Okay, part of what I want to illustrate is, in fact, you have to do a lot of thinking about this stuff. Um, and those choices you have to make to implement high dimensional methods, you have to choose a variety of things and many of those things should hopefully be motivated by your underlying economic intuition for the problem. All right, um, so with that said, let me just move on and actually start talking about some examples. Okay. So the first example I want to talk about is a, taken from a series of papers by Paterba, Venti, and Wise. Um, there are responses to these papers by Engen, Gell, and Scholes, and there was in the mid-90s, I cited three, but there are at least 10 papers on the basic topic of what is the effect of 401ks on people's wealth accumulation, their savings, something along those lines. Okay, so. The baseline model, this is roughly the model that is estimated in the Paterno-Venti-Wise papers. Um, I admit I have not looked at those papers in five or six years. I just have this data set that Jim was nice enough to give me and I have applied it, assuming that these are the controls he used, which my recollection is they are because this is what I started doing when I did this back with Jim once upon a time. But, um, it, they may have changed, I don't know. Anyway, the basic specification is the following. We've got some measure of assets. So accumulated assets on the left-hand side, that's going to be the variable of interest. All right. Um, the two things I'll look at are net financial assets, which as its name, forgetting the net, which is a little confusing, I'm not going to worry about, is just things you hold in financial assets, stocks, bonds, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, the other thing I'll look at is total wealth which of course is not total wealth when you think about human capital and a bunch of other stuff, but this is total wealth as measured in the survey of income and program participation. So this is your house, various things you own, your car, et cetera. Okay, so those are the two outcomes I'll be looking at. Um, the variable of interest here, I've labeled D to be consistent with the other notation we've been using, that's whether or not the person is eligible to receive a 401k. All right, and what we really wanna know is when this program came around, when people had access to 401ks, did that increase some measure of savings? All right, and we might be interested in that for a variety of reasons, and hopefully as economists you can think of some of those, and I don't need to talk too much about that. Okay. Now, in addition to that, well, I'll talk about X in just a second. Let me remind you of one important thing that came across in, hopefully in Victor's talk, and which is important when thinking about these methods, at least as we know how to use them now, um, for answering economic problems. The thing that we're really interested in is small dimensional. Okay? If we were interested in some 
underlying very high dimensional object, then the things Victor talked about where you can sort of decompose this, say, all right, well, we can screw up, we can have model selection mistakes in estimating this nuisance part, and those don't spill over onto the low dimensional part. That's not going to be true if we actually have to do selection about that low dimensional part. Okay? So it's important in everything we're doing that we're conditioning on, we're economists, we know this is what we want to learn about. We want to learn about the effect of being eligible for a 401k on how much assets you have. That's one thing where there's no selection over that one thing. We don't care whether we're not going to try to learn that that's identically zero. That might be some ex post thing we do. But that variable is in the model. That's the thing we want to learn about. Okay? Now, once we've got that thing we want to learn about, we have these other controls. Okay, so in the Paterno Venti Wise example, um, the argument roughly for identification is the following. I'll tell you what the controls are in just a second. This is data from the 1991 Survey of Income Program Participation. I'll wave four, it doesn't really matter. Okay, and the argument for why you might be able to treat 401k eligibility as exogenous, conditional on stuff, is roughly as follows. Like I said, we're going to condition on this argument being true. Okay, there are good reasons it might not be, but you can talk to me about those later, and I'll say those are good reasons, and then we'll move on. Okay, so the argument is as follows. In 1991, this is data collected, of course, around 1991, 401ks were pretty new. Okay, now we know that in principle, if people had arbitrary foresight, they should be choosing which job they have based on whether or not they will be eligible for a 401k. And of course, if they're doing that and of whether they want to have a 401k is correlated to something that we don't observe, say how much they like saving, then if we just run the regression of wealth on whether or not you're eligible for a 401k, we're not going to be able to figure out whether we're learning the effect of being eligible for a 401k or whether we're learning the effect of just the fact you like to save. Okay, so the argument is that, okay, that's fair, but this is when 401ks were new. We're hoping people really weren't super foresighted and they didn't sit down and think, all right, when I take this job in 1990, I'm going to take it because maybe they'll offer me a 401k in 1991. And so they're not thinking about that. But we do know that preferences for saving, or we assume, and it seems reasonable, might be related to people's incomes. Okay. So maybe for a variety of reasons, when we see people have higher incomes, they also like to save more. Okay? It's also true, certainly at this time period, that if you were in a job where income was going to be high, you were much more likely to be offered a 401k. Okay? So their argument was roughly the big source of endogeneity, of confounding here, is the fact that people have this income thing. Income is related to how much they like to save. Income is related to whether they have a 401k. If we don't control for income, then what we're estimating is a confounded effect between the effect of actual 401ks and the effect of preference for savings. But once we control for income, everything's good. Okay? So that's a very simplified version of you know, 12 papers. So with that simplified version out of the way, that leaves us with this question of, all right, well, we need to control for income. Okay? Once we've done that, we have exogenous variation. We can estimate the effect of 401ks and go home. All right, so what did Peter Venti and Wise do? They did a very sensible thing. They went out and got some data. In their data, they had measures of income. They had measures of other things which seemed plausibly related to income and other factors we might care about. And they controlled for, I don't remember, I could count them right here, but I'll say 15. It's in the ballpark of 15. 15 characteristics. Okay, those characteristics are dummy variables for income categories. All right, and you can see the income categories they used up there. Um, they included age and age squared. Clearly, we can think of stories for why preferences for saving and wealth accumulation would be related to how old a person is. All right, they controlled for how big your family is, how much education you have, whether or not you're married, um, two earners. So this is household level data. So they control for whether there are two earners in the household or just one earner in the household. Um, defined benefit, whether you have access to a defined benefit, um, pension plan which arguably is endogenous, but again, we're conditioning on all this being fine, whether you have an IRA, whether you're a homeowner. Okay, so there's their variables. They have 9,915 observations. We've got 15 controls. We run OLS of some measure of wealth, say net to total financial assets or total wealth, 
and we get some estimates for the impact of being eligible for a 401k on accumulated savings. Okay, and those estimates are at the bottom of this slide. Um, the estimated impact of net financial, or sorry, of 401k eligibility on net financial assets is 9,216 additional dollars in accumulated assets if you're eligible for a 401k with a standard error of around $1,000. Okay, and on total wealth, the effect is smaller. Um, sort of a slightly bigger standard error. We can tell stories for substitution between asset classes. So if you're given a 401k, that's of course tax advantage financial assets. So you should shift some of your saving into those tax advantage financial assets, maybe not as much actual total wealth accumulation. We can tell stories along those lines and you know that's part of what they did. Okay, so that's the baseline. And I think that's a sensible baseline. I think the thing that you need to keep in mind, and we're conditioning on their argument being true, they need to control for income, all right? If their story is right, controlling for income is the key to getting exogenous variation in eligibility that we can use to actually learn the effect of eligibility, all right? So a question that a person might ask, maybe you wouldn't, I would, is, all right, seven income categories. Is that controlling for income? That's kind of flexible, but we could think of other things to do. Victor talked about this little education example where a simple function in education, you know, it kind of gets the pattern of how wages change with education, but it misses some important stuff. Are these seven dummy variables sufficient to capture the entire pattern well enough that what we're left over is, is can be taken as as good as randomly assigned? Okay, that's a question we might ask. Um, what might happen? There might be more complicated nonlinearity. There might be interactions. Their model is everything's nice and additively separable. Your income and your age don't interact. So wealth, wealthy older people are exactly the same as wealthy younger people. All right, maybe that matters. We don't know. But that's, of course, arbitrarily disallowed in their specification. And they're smart guys. I'm sure they thought about these things and said, well, we can't do everything, so here's 15 things we can try, and there they go. All right. Now, in addition to just asking, did we do a good enough controlling for income, there's another question that we sort of didn't talk much about, but we might be able to do better in terms of what they did, just in, from an efficiency standpoint, okay? So one thing which I don't think is happening with 15 variables and 9,000 plus, ten, nearly 10,000 observations, is we might be over controlling, okay? Maybe we've put too much stuff in there and we're losing efficiency because we're just absorbing degrees of freedom. Like, so that, that seems like a terrible straw man in this example, but it's at least possible. Okay, think more importantly, suppose we were to take the baseline that eligibility was actually randomly assigned. Okay, which I think most of us would agree it's not, but pretend for a second you thought it was randomly assigned. Even then, you might want to control for more than 15 things to absorb residual variation and get more precise estimates of the effect of the randomly assigned variable. Okay, so we've got this baseline, it's a sensible baseline, but we are wondering, or at least I'm wondering, and I'm trying to convince you that you should wonder, whether we've done an adequate job in addressing both the identification concern, did we do a good enough job controlling for, say, income and age, and asking, could we do better in terms of efficiency? All right, so, that's the questions I want to address here. All right, and the sort of overarching theme of the entire two days worth of lectures has been, you know, regularization is a good idea. What's regularization? It's variable selection, dimension reduction, however you want to talk about it. You know, we've got this really complicated world out there. We'd like to learn about this complicated world, but if we allow the world to be arbitrarily complicated, we can't learn anything. All right, so we have to impose dimension reduction somewhere. All right, and I think it's important to note, if I went back to, say, my income control question, sorry, I'm wondering. If we went back to my income control question, um, we might come back and say, well, gee, I don't know how to control for income. Maybe to adequately control for income, I just need a coefficient for every single person in the sample because every single person could have a different effect of income on their saving preferences. It's possible, okay? If that's the world I want to live in, that, that's fine. I don't think any of us want to live in that world or we wouldn't be here, we'd be doing theory somewhere, okay? Um, but if that's the world we want to live in, the answer to any 
inference question based on data is you can't learn anything. Okay, once I allow for arbitrary complexity in the world, I have no way to learn about the world from data because the next observation I see could be arbitrarily different from anything I've seen so far. So I have to, at some point, impose regularization on the problem. And often, we impose regularization on the problem by intuition. You know, that's what Perturbo Venti Wise did in these examples I talked about. They have some economic intuition. They're smart guys. They sat down. They thought about this. Said, here's the key driver of omitted variables bias. It's income. Why is the income? Because we're economists. We thought about this. That's what we think is driving it. Once we have decided that income is the key driver of omitted variables bias, we're going to try to flexibly control for income. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do in flexible functional form based on seven dummy variables. OK, fine. All right, that would correspond on this slide. Let's see, yeah, I don't know how this works. But the second bullet point says intuition. OK, intuition is probably the most commonly applied way to do regularization or dimension reduction in applied work everywhere. You sit down, you think about the problem, you come up with your list of your favorite confounds, you put them in the model, and you go home. And we're all familiar with the tables that show up in applied papers. You then do some small tweaks to that set of confounds and say, ah, the results don't change that much when I tweak this set of confounds by a variable or two, so everything's fine. All right, not a bad idea. I want to be very clear about this. That's actually a really good idea, okay? The stuff we've been talking about for the last couple of days is hopefully a way to add in a little bit additional to that already very sensible thing that people are already doing. Okay? So another approach, which is, of course, the gold standard, and we would all love to do it, is the first approach to dimension reduction, which is we just randomly assign stuff. Okay? If we randomly assign the treatment, then we have already reduced the dimension of the necessary control set to zero. Okay? We don't have to control for anything. We might want to control for stuff to improve efficiency, but if we really have randomly assigned the treatment, then we've randomly assigned the treatment. We can go out, compare two means, and go home. All right? So that would be great. Obviously, we didn't randomly assign 401k eligibility, and unfortunately, we don't randomly assign a lot of the stuff that we do in economics. Okay? Even if you did do random assignment, sometimes the world's complicated. Maybe you do stratified random sampling. Maybe you do something else. Maybe people have done stratified random sampling. They haven't told you how they did the stratification. In which case, you still have to control for the things that you stratified on. All right. So even in that idealized random assignment world, there is still scope in principle for doing variable selection sorts of ideas. All right. Now, the thing that we're going to, or we've been talking about for the last couple of days, are formal regularization procedures. Okay. I'm going to focus on formal model selection procedures, but you know there are lots of regularization procedures. That's fine. You've heard about several of those, and you can go read about a lot more. Okay. Um, now, a very important thing, which has sort of been under the rug, I feel, in the last couple of days of lectures, is formal model selection is a really nice idea. But it is, I think, exactly equivalent to the problem of searching for a needle in a haystack. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go out and say the world's really complicated. There is this signal out there that we're trying to learn about. That's our needle. Okay, And then everything that could explain the world is our haystack. All right, now, something, you know, if you looked at Victor's rate conditions, this shows up. There's a log p in all those rate conditions. All right, and Victor said, oh, log p, that's small, we don't need to worry about it. Well, if p is e to the n, log p is really, really big. And you do have to worry about it. Okay. So what we're doing when we do formal variable selection, it's very important to keep in mind, you still can't do everything. You still have to use economic intuition to guide yourself to keep that haystack to a manageable size. Now, once the haystack's a manageable size, then we're going to hope we can sift through that haystack and find the needle. Okay? The usual intuition approach to doing dimension reduction corresponds to the case where we already said the haystack has eight pieces in it. Some of them are needles, some of them are hay, but there are only eight pieces. We're going to look at all eight. Okay? The formal approach to dimension reduction says it's a pretty big haystack. Most of it's hay. There's some needles in there. Something that, again, if you look at those rate conditions really carefully, what you'll see is if the haystack is really big, those needles should also better be really, really big, or you won't be able to find them. Okay? So there's some trade-offs here. 
you have to think carefully about this, and that's part of what I want to talk about. So what are we going to do? We're going to use our economic intuition to help us to keep that haystack to a manageable size. And when that haystack's to a manageable size, we're going to apply these methods, say lasso, to try to find the needles. All right? But again, I think it's important to keep in mind, you can't make the haystack arbitrarily large. That gets you back to the world where you can't learn anything. All right? So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Here's a slightly more formal or more laid out approach to the intuitive dimension reduction that we talked about. Okay, so there are a bunch of choices that PVW made. They chose the data, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but there it is. They made some a priori selections about the data they were going to look at. In particular, the SIPP is actually a panel, they ignored the panel aspect. That's fine, we can talk about that later. Okay. They also imposed some criteria on things like age to you know, keep things to a sensible population. Of course, that's also controlling for age in a very flexible manner along the dimensions you cut, but we're not going to worry about that either. Okay, now, anytime you approach real data, you're all aware of this, there is a data selection step that is roughly unavoidable. Okay, so the SAPP wave four, I looked it up before, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago when I was putting these slides together, has 655 raw variables in it. All right. Now, if we started off with 655 variables, in principle we could do that. Okay, the variable selection methods say, well, you know, P665 and 9915, eh, okay. Okay, um, maybe we could even try some functional form tricks in there, which I'll do in just a minute. But that's a pretty big set of variables. And a priori, we know most of those things aren't going to matter, or we hope they aren't going to matter. So if you look at those 665 variables, a whole bunch of them are purely administrative technical kinds of variables that obviously don't work. We throw those away. Okay? Perturbaventian Ys have told us a story, which we're leaving right now, that really we need to control for income and things that look like they might proxy for income or savings preferences. So we sift through that set of 655 variables and we come up with nine variables that look like they might proxy for either preference savings or income. Why did we choose those nine variables? Well, I chose them because that's what Petura Venti Wise chose and I'm too lazy to go back to the SIP and actually draw my own data. But I presume they chose those because they actually carefully thought about things uh, of these 655 variables. Here are nine of them that look like they are important confounds. Okay? Now once we've got those nine variables, we choose a functional form. Their functional form, like I said, was those dummies, a quadratic in age, some dummies for education. All right? Now, that's all fine. We gave you those results. What does formal dimension reduction look like? Okay, so first of all, we need a model. Victor talked about this model. Here's a partially linear model. We have one parameter of interest. Parameter of interest is the effect of 401k eligibility on either total wealth or net financial assets. All right? We then have this confounding effect, g of x. What is that? That's omitted variables, whatever it is. That's the control we need for income. All right? And then we have an unobservable. We're going to do what we did in Victor's talk, and we're going to approximate that function, g of x, with a linear combination of other stuff. All right, so this is the approximately sparse model where my z i prime beta g is the linear approximation to g of x, and then we've, I should probably call that a zeta tilde, but I'm not going to, we've thrown the approximation error into the unobserved stuff. All right, and we're going to do the same thing for the treatment. Based on the intuition and the model that Victor already talked about, we know that we need to model both the propensity which is you know, the, whether or not you have eligibility as a function of important confounds, and we also need to model the outcome. All right, so there's our model. We're assuming that conditional on this set of characteristics, in particular income, that those error terms have mean of zero. All right, so given this, we write down the two reduced forms. One reduced form for financial assets or total wealth, another reduced form for whether or not you're eligible for a 401k. Okay? So second big picture in terms of stuff Victor talked about using these high dimensional methods and putting them into a treatment framework or you know, a sort of structural estimation framework more generally, the statistical methods for doing high dimensional modeling are all designed for prediction. Okay? At least the ones I know. All right? Now, 
Why do we work, look, go back to reduced forms? What are reduced forms? Those are predictive relationships. Once you've turned your structural model into a set of predictive relationships, it's plug and play with your favorite method to do prediction. All right, I'm going to use lasso because Victor and I have some nice results on lasso. It's easy. There are some nice features about lasso. If you don't like lasso, if you like you know, SCAD or your other favorite way to approach variable selection, I'm going to argue it doesn't matter that much. Victor might disagree. He might say we haven't done the theory. But I'm going to argue it probably doesn't matter that much. What's important is you go back to prediction problems and you use methods that are good for doing the prediction problems. All right? You then figure out how you do a good job predicting things, which is what the data can actually tell you about. You use your economic model coupled with what the data can tell you about to learn about the effect of the economic parameter of interest. All right? So that's the game. Okay. Um, and then this is just a quick recap, I guess, of what Victor talked about. Why do we want these two equations? Why not just focus, say, on the first equation? Well, we get some nice robustness by looking at two equations. The reduced form for the treatment is hopefully fairly clear what robustness we get there. We're finding variables that are strongly predictive of the treatment. Variables that strongly predict whether you've received the treatment are pretty good candidates for things that might cause omitted variables bias. So we want to make sure we control for those. All right. What do we get from the reduced form for the outcome? Well, of course, we find variables that are strongly related to the outcome. That gives us two things. Number one, if those variables are strongly related to the outcome, but they don't have much predictive power for the treatment, they'll help us improve efficiency by absorbing residual variation. The other thing we get is, as Victor talked about, a problem with all this variable selection stuff is variable selection is, in real life, or at least under assumptions I think represent real life, never perfect. So even though we're going to find a lot of important confounds in that first step, there's a possibility we miss some because the coefficients in that first step are small but non-zero. And they're big enough that if you ignored them, you would still have big omitted variables bias. All right, so what are we doing? Well, we're looking at the outcome equation. Anything in the outcome equation that has a big coefficient could be associated with a co small coefficient in the treatment equation. And failing to control for that would lead to omitted variables bias. Okay. What we're missing when we look at these two steps is things with small predictability for the outcome and small predictability for the treatment. And if you combine small predictability at both those stages, it washes out at least in theory. Okay. And you could all ask, does it matter in practice? And that's a good question. But the theory says it's fine. Okay. So that's what we're going to try to do. All right. Now. Given that we've laid out sort of our framework, our model, we have choices to make again. So number one, data set. Same thing as PVW because that's the data I have. Number two, baseline variables. Okay, same as PVW because again, that's what I have. And they gave us, hopefully in their papers, a compelling argument that us as the economists would be compelled to make in our own papers for why this is a good set of characteristics to control for to hopefully get around that omitted variables bias. These are really the features that are driving the endogeneity. Okay? If we miss features that are driving the endogeneity at this stage, doing high dimensional methods aren't going to help us. All right? So we need to have done a good job thinking about, we have a clear idea of where the endogeneity is coming from, and we have a clear idea of how to control for that. Okay, we get rid of income and things that look like income. All right. Now, we could, at least in principle, think about adding additional variables. That might be a good idea. It might not. I'm not going to do it. Okay. The thing to remember, anytime you add an additional variable, you're making that haystack bigger. And that's going to reduce your flexibility in other dimensions. So if I add another variable, you know, one more variable probably doesn't matter. But if I start thinking about interactions and polynomials and you know, what sorts of transformations should I really be taking, one more variable quickly makes the space of things I'm considering much bigger. All right. So I hopefully have a good idea of what those variables might be doing before I start just going out and adding additional variables at this stage. All right. Now, what else do I need to do? I need to choose functional form. I need to choose functional form to control for income. I want to be very flexible on that because that's sort of my, at least my straw man, that's the thing I think is driving the endogeneity. So I want to really do a good job controlling for income. All right. And I'll give you some more details on the way I chose to do that in just a second. Before I do that, 
we've still got our method for selecting the models we're going to use. My choice is going to be lasso. There are other choices you could do. I'm going to use lasso. And I want to just remind you really quickly what we have to do to actually use lasso. Okay, so first of all, I think most of us who were trained in economics, at least since I went into graduate school probably earlier, believe the world is fundamentally heteroscedastic. So we're going to use the heteroscedastic version of lasso that Victor talked about. All right, and if you remember, it roughly has this form. We have to choose a penalty parameter that I've called lambda hat. We have to choose these loadings on the betas, which I've called gamma hat. All right, theoretically, I'll give you the expressions in just a second. Those are choice things, or things that have to be estimated from the data to implement this procedure. All right, now, once I give you lambda hat and gamma hat, things are trivial. You go out, you use your favorite software package, Stata, R, MATLAB, I assume this is in other things, and you do lasso and you get answers. All right, so how do we choose these two things? First of all, gamma hat. All right, gamma hat turns out to be the annoying one in practice, but gamma hat, at least in principle, we know what we want, okay? We know, theoretically, that gamma hat should look like the average of, or sorry, the variance of the score, the variance of xi epsilon i, all right? And if we knew epsilon i, we wouldn't, this would be trivial, we would just go out and plug in epsilon i and that would give us our gamma hats. We don't know epsilon i and that's where the pain comes in. So what do we do? For a fixed value of lambda, we go out and we guess a value, an initial value for beta. The easiest one, the one Victor mentioned, is zero. So we just plug zero in for all the betas. That gives us an estimate of the residuals. We use that estimated residual to form these penalty weights. We then go out, we estimate the lasso coefficients or the post-lasso coefficients. We get new estimates of the residuals. We plug those in and form new penalty weights and we go through that thing until we get convergence. All right, um, in my, the stuff I've done, I've either iterated these to convergence or stopped after 100 iterations. In every one that I checked, the convergence was achieved in fewer than 20 iterations, but I have to admit I did enough of these things in preparing these slides that I didn't check the convergence of all of them. Okay, so it's possible some of these went to the full 100. I, if you care, you can go get my code and check on your own later. Okay, so that's the basic idea. For a fixed value of lambda, that's easy. Okay, how do we choose lambda? We've talked about two methods during the last couple of days. One is cross-validation, one is using a theoretical value. Theoretical value is super simple. You put a number in, you stop, and you let the thing run. All right? Um, there are a couple of choices I use in the examples. They are both bounds on the theoretical value that shows up in the paper. Um, why I chose to use two different bounds instead of just one is hysteresis on the way code is written that it originally started off as one and morphed into another and you get roughly the same answers and that's what it is. Okay, um, these bounds do depend on a choice parameter. Okay, so we know what P is. Phi inverse is of course the inverse of a normal CDF. Okay, we know what N is. I think there might be an N missing in the uh, simple bound one but you can look up the papers for the details. All right. Q is a choice parameter. Theoretically, we need Q to go to zero, okay? Um, in most of the things I've done, I've set Q equal to 0 0.1 divided by the max of P or N, which is a number Victor and I and Alex have used and seem we like, okay? That 0.1, if you remember what T Matt Taddy talked about yesterday, he talked about the rule of thumb for false discovery rates is 0.1 that people will use. Q here is, at some level related to false discovery rates. Q is related to the, the size of a test for the null hypothesis that the biggest coefficient is equal, or sorry, under the null that all the coefficients are equal to zero, Q is a critical value drawn from the distribution for the maximum of your estimate scores, but related to the estimators of beta hat under the null that everything's equal to zero. So you can think about, you know, if Q is really small, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to choose this penalty so that things enter the model only when I'm pretty sure the coefficient's non-zero. If Q is really big, you're saying, ah, I'm going to let the everything enter the model. And you can see how that works. If I set Q equal to, um, what is it, one, I forget which direction it goes. 
Q at some at one of the cutoffs, either one or zero, gives me a penalty of zero, which says everything goes into the model. All right. Um, and looking at the normal CDF one, that would be Q of zero because phi inverse of one is in R. Sorry. Q of whatever. Sorry. Phi inverse of infinity is. I'm sorry. I'm, I'll stop here because I'm getting myself confused. All right. Um, you can figure it out. All right. Um, you know, the two, th so the two things we've used are 0.05 or 0.1 divided by max Pn, and no application that we've looked at has that made a difference. Um, in principle, it could. If you choose Q to be a very, very tiny number, that would matter. If you chose Q to be a very, very big number, that would matter. You know, we're choosing sort of tell probabilities. Okay. Cross validation is at some level fully automated. There's, you know, no Q that goes into that. Um, as Victor mentioned, there is an issue that it may not be theoretically justified in the settings we're looking at. It's probably valid, but the theory isn't there yet. Okay. Um, the practical issue is that when we're doing cross-validation, I'm trying to do it right, which means we're cross-validating the entire procedure, which means we're iteratively estimating the penalty loadings inside each of the cross-validation steps. All right. It takes quite a while, as opposed to the simple homoscholastic case Matt Taddy talked about yesterday, where cross-validation is actually really, really simple. The iterative estimation of the penalty loading slows the thing down by maybe a factor of 10. Okay, so it, you know, it's not trivial. All right, um, I'm going to report results with both. And what you're going to see is you can't tell the difference. Or I, I should say that. You can tell the difference. It's not clear they're economically meaningful. All right. Oh, the other thing that I think is important to mention about the cross-validation I'm using. Matt mentioned two rules for using, choosing the cross-validation parameter. One is the obvious, just choose the minimum value of the cross-validation. The other is choose a value which is one standard error away from the minimum of the cross-validation. Because what we're actually doing here is cross-validating post-lasso, that in and of itself is less stable than the generic, simple, very simple plug-in lambda, or sorry, homoscedastic version, OK? Laying off by one standard error actually really helps with the stability of the cross-validation here. All right, so you know that's Efren's rule of thumb. Matt mentioned it. That's the rule of thumb I'm going to use. It does seem to look better in terms of stability of the things you're choosing. All right. Um, so with all that out of the way, the other really important choice, which is unavoidable, is we still have to specify a functional form to search over. Okay. We might not want to, but we've got to do it. Okay. So I would like to be very flexible. Using lasso gives us the ability to be very flexible. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to use what five dummy variables for the obvious categorical variables. Okay. Um, I did all of this in Stata. The code will be available sometime if it's not already. Um, because I'm lazy, I've made fifth degree polynomial in family and schooling, a third degree polynomial in um, Family size using Stata's orth poly command. I actually don't know which orthogonal polynomial Stata uses because it's not in the documentation that I had available, but it's some orthogonal polynomial. And you know that's what it is. So one's a fifth degree orthogonal polynomial, one's a third degree orthogonal polynomial. All right. I thought the effect of age might be important in nonlinear for reasons that we sort of talked about. So I put in a tenth um, a cubic spline with 10 equally spaced knot points. That's 30 total terms in age. I put in a cubic spline with 15 equally spaced knot points, that's 45 terms, to control for income. Okay. Now, since I was worried that there might be interactions, I took those five dummy variables and interacted them with everything. That gives me 190 interaction terms. I then took, or sorry, with schooling, family size, and age, I then took those and interacted them because, remember, age, and in particular, sorry, not age, income was the variable that we were really worried about. So I took those 190 interaction terms and interacted them fully with my 45 terms in income. And that gave me a total of 10,485 terms to control for income. All right, now you might argue that 10,485 terms is insufficient to control for income. Um, maybe it is, I'll never know, neither will you. Okay, but it seems pretty flexible. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I have to admit, after doing this and looking at the distributions of some of these things, which I should have done ex ante, but again, I'm lazy and I am an econometrician mainly, so I don't think about this stuff. But um, I shouldn't have used equally spaced knot points. I should have used 15 unequally spaced knot points, but whatever. Same idea. Okay, so 
When you look at this, that gives me a total of 10,763 variables. All right. Now, of course, you all know that that's insane given that I have 9,900 observations. Okay. The goal here is to convince myself that whatever functional form I need to control for for income, I can get it. Okay. If I can't approximate it with this, it's true that I'm in trouble, but this seems pretty flexible. All right. It's important to note, this is a choice you have to make. Okay, maybe I should have put in 20,000 variables. I don't know. Neither does anyone else. As we increase the number of variables, the ability to pick out the true signal gets harder. So we want to try to think about things. All right, this is sensible. This is giving us an overarching picture. Do I really think I need all these terms? Probably not. And that comes back to sparsity. Okay, so the final assumption we need is we need to believe that among this 10,763 variables, there is a sparse representation that captures the effect of income. Okay? And what does that mean? That means not that the loadings on you know, five of these variables are non-zero and the rest of them are exactly zero. We're allowing for approximate sparsity. It means that the loadings on a bunch of these things are big enough we can pick them out. The loonings on the rest of them approach zero in a way that ignoring that part of the approximation, just as with traditional non-parametrics, isn't going to be a huge bias on the resulting estimates. Okay? And, you know, again, this is subject to debate, as is everything. Is a 30th order, or sorry, a 15 knot spline, cubic spline, and income interacted with all this stuff sufficient to control for income? I don't know, but I am personally willing to believe that whatever effect I need to control for income is captured pretty well by some low dimensional representation within this space of things. All right? That's a fundamental belief. I have to believe that All right, to use the sparsity based methods. Maybe there are other methods that would work. Sparsity based, high dimensional methods, I have to believe that. All right? So that's my belief. Now, given this, we of course know if within my space of 10,763 possible functions, I actually thought I needed to control for every single one of them, I would be done. I could not possibly learn the effect of income, or sorry, of 401k eligibility from 9,900 observations controlling for 11,000 things. It's impossible. By the way, if someone from Stata ever watches these videos, you need to increase the mat size beyond 11,000. Um, <laughs> the the um, reason that this is cut at 10,763, I originally tried a higher order, not a fifth order polynomial, but a sixth order polynomial, and that put me over 11,000 variables and stated didn't like that. So um, anyway, that's an aside, but that would be nice. So we've got our 11,000 variables, which is generated by the fact that I'm using Stata instead of MATLAB or R or something else at this point. Okay, that's what we're going to search over. Now, we've got that. Okay, we're going to do the selection. We'll get some results out. Um, this doesn't matter, but it might help make some of these coefficients or the variables I've selected make more sense. I normalized all the income and age to be on the zero one interval just because it made sense to me. Okay, so when you say C income minus 0.33, that's not income minus 33 cents. That's income minus, or sorry, that's normalized income subtract one third of the way across the scale. Okay, so. When I look at what variables do I select in the propensity score equation, the ver equation to predict 401k eligibility given my set of controls, I found this interesting. I get exactly the same set of variables whether I use cross-validation or a plug-in rule. Those give me identical sets of variables, um, which is coincidental, I admit, but I was happy about that. So I only have to present one set of results. Okay. Um, so the set of variables you can see there, um, this might be surprising. It's not that surprising. Simple functional forms seem to, seem to do a pretty good job. What do we have? We have the linear term in income. So we've just got a linear effect with a little kink for high income. Okay. We then have some stuff interacted with income. We have a cubic in age, which if you look at that, it's sort of flat and then does something funny. All right, if you actually plot these things, they're not ridiculous, but those are the variables you choose. Um, not surprisingly, given that we were worried about income, the variables you choose are related either to income or to age, or things like whether you own a home, which is obviously a proxy for something about income, whether you have an IRA, which is a proxy for something about income. So we're choosing variables that correspond to our intuition. All right, now 
What are we going to do? We're not done yet. This is just the first step of our double selection. So we're going to take these variables, set them aside, and then we're going to estimate predictive e relationships for either total wealth or net financial assets. All right, and that's on this slide. Okay, again, interestingly enough, in this example, cross-validation and the plug-in penalty give you identical coefficients. Sorry, I shouldn't say identical coefficients. They give you identical selected variables for either net financial assets or total wealth. Okay, the variables I won't go through, but they're still sort of parsimonious functional forms, mainly in income and age. All right, and once you condition for all this, you know, so now we've got a different set of variables. Um, the size of this set of variables is remarkably close to the original size of the set of variables chosen by Perturb of NTY. So they chose, like I said, like 15 or 16 variables. We end up with between 15 or 17 variables. So we're in the same ballpark. You know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for those guys, and I'm not surprised that they basically controlled for what you needed to control for. All right, if you look at the effects, the effects are somewhat attenuated relative to the original results. Why? Well, maybe these things are actually soaking out more of the income effect that was in the residuals because his functional form wasn't capturing some of these kinks and especially the interactions. All right. And then you could go back and if you're Eng and Gellin Schultz, you could argue that that means really what's going on is there's omitted preferences for saving and we just showed that you're picking some of that up. So maybe you haven't picked all of it up yet and maybe there's a problem and we should go back and think more carefully about this. I'm conditioning on that not being a concern here, but that, that's a sensible question you might ask. Um, as you can see, like I said, the effects are somewhat attenuated relative to the PVW effects. The standard errors are slightly smaller. There appears to be a slight increase in efficiency. We must be soaking some additional residual variation out that they weren't. All right. Um, results are roughly in line with the PVW results, though. Okay. So, um, in terms of big picture, this is something that I want to get across again. I don't think any of us are arguing one should use high dimensional results to replace what you're already doing. I think there's something reassuring about being able to go out and say, look, I tried this heuristic, intuitive way to control for income. I think it's good enough. Here are the results. But just in case I miss something important, I've tried this really broad set of controls. I've carefully searched through them. And look, I get roughly the same answers. Okay, I think that's nice. Other people may disagree. All right, that's fine. But I think that's a nice thing that can go on here. We'll see in another example. Maybe you'll pick up something that you didn't initially think. All right, so that's these results. Okay, one other thing we can do in this application, the treatment effect or the treatment variable here is 0, 1. So we can talk about what Victor did. The previous model was a nice additively separable model. So it was this partially linear framework, very simple. Instead of doing that, we could actually go out and allow for a fully heterogeneous model. If you want to, you can embed this in the usual potential outcome framework, and we could talk about that. Okay, you can estimate the average treatment effect aligned for fully heterogeneous treatment effects. Okay, importantly, despite the fact we are allowing for fully heterogeneous treatment effects, we are still estimating one parameter. There is no selection over that parameter. We have the thing we want to learn about. We're going to go out and try to control for the other stuff. Those are nuisance functions. But there is no selection over this average treatment effect. We have our target. Our target is low dimensional. Okay. The examples I'm going to give today, the target is one dimensional. It doesn't have to be one. It could be two or three or five. But it's some fixed low dimensional thing that you want to learn about. All right. Now, our framework then, we have our parentheses score equation, which is exactly the first stage from before, where we regress eligibility on x's. Okay, Our outcome equation allowing for fully heterogeneous effects can be represented as Victor did, where we take the treatment variable and interact it with two different functions of x. We allow those functions to be different. Okay, So that's our g1 of x and our g0 of x. All right, And then what we're going to do is we're going to take Hahn's moment condition, use that to estimate the average treatment effect. Okay, So at this point, the inputs are roughly the same, so I can go through this without all the setup as they were before. We want to estimate the function m, which we've already done. We want to estimate the functions g0 and g1. The way we're going to do that, we're going to take all of our data. We're going to run variable selection. We're going to get the things that look like they predict g1. We're going to get the things that look like they predict g0. We're going to get the things that look like they predict m. We're going to put all of those together, form some estimates of averages, plug them into my little formula for alpha hat, 
and it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so again, there's state of code for this that will eventually be posted, but this is just you know a fairly straightforward exercise. Oops. Okay, so we already did estimates of m. To do our estimates for the two different g functions, we need penalty parameters. Okay, rather than redo the entire CV exercise, I cheated and took CV from the full exercise and scaled it so that corresponds to the right number of observations for each of the G0 and G1 parts. Okay, you know, nothing says I couldn't have done full cross-validation again or I couldn't have used the plug-in here, but that was a nice, simple thing to do. All right, um, I'm not going to talk about all these variables again, but you select some variables in each of those equations. They look very similar to the variables you selected before. It's not that surprising. All right, the point estimates are very similar to what they were before. And, you know, people who, you know, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but I will, um, partially estimates from partially linear models versus full heterogeneous estimates of average treatment effects, they tend to look pretty similar. Um, and they do here, and they're pretty similar. You know, the story's exactly the same. Standard errors are very similar. All right, so that's example one, okay? This is a straight application of what Victor talked about with the double selection. There's nothing you know, more fancy than that here. All right, and to reiterate the choices, there are a bunch of choices that go in. Hopefully, you're, I'm conveying the, in, or the thought that while you can be flexible, you can't be arbitrarily flexible. You should still use economics to guide your intuition about where these functions are, what are the sources of endogeneity, how am I going to construct controls to get out those sources of endogeneity and really account for that. If I tried to do everything, I would learn that I couldn't do anything. Okay. Um, all right, so I don't even know how long I have to talk, but um, I saw a question. I know I'm not supposed to take questions, but So there is something. You want to repeat the question? On yeah. So thank you. So the question was, you know, when you do these, and this is absolutely true, when you do these fully automated things, they are fully automated, okay? And variables are going to pop out like homeowner times age, homeowner without homeowner in the model or age in the model, or homeowner times age squared without homeowner homeowner by itself, age by itself, age squared by itself. That can absolutely happen. Okay. If you look at Victor's picture from before the break, maybe you didn't see that. Okay, that corresponds to there being a really sharp, discon not discontinuity, but the fact that this function, you know, it's kind of zero across here, and then there's something wiggly out here. Okay, do we want that? If I saw these, so maybe the question could also be rephrased, if I saw this and I really wanted to put in homeowner and age as well, would that mess anything up? As long as homeowner and age and age squared are only three variables, the answer is no. Go ahead, throw those in. If your results change dramatically because you threw those three variables in, then something broke here because that shouldn't happen. We chose the things that were going to make things change a lot, okay? But if it makes you feel better to have those in the model, um, as long as the number of them is small, then that's really not gonna affect things. Now the problem would be if we chose, you know, not in this case, but we chose homeowner times age to the 100th and we didn't have any of the previous variables. Well, there's a question of whether we should have been considering that, and that goes back to, you know, how many things do you really want to consider? But when you throw 99 more variables in, that might be enough variables that you would actually break things. But if you're throwing just a couple of additional variables in, that's not going to matter. Or the theory says it shouldn't matter. In practice, if it does matter, then something's wrong. Okay? Either you broke something when you did the estimation, or one of these assumptions we're making is just terribly violated. Okay? Um, and I didn't do that, but and it would actually be worth considering. I don't know what would happen, but my strong belief, given that we've chosen the variables which are meant to drive changes, is that things wouldn't be altered by adding those a couple of additional things. So that's a great question. Okay, so with that question done, let's look at example two. All right, um, so here's an example that I am fairly sure most people are familiar with. Um, this is trying to understand the effect of abortion rates on crime rates, okay? Um, and you know, the idea, as 
the title suggests is that's the causal question of interest. Is there a causal link between abortion rates and future crime rates? So, you know, I'm not sure I defined this carefully in the paper, but this is the effective abortion rate related to the crime rate, and that means this is a weighted average of abortion rates like 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, whatever years in the past. So this, the timing here is lined up so it's not ridiculous. Okay, um, and I'm not going to make that explicit at any point beyond this, but the timing here actually makes sense. Okay, so we want to estimate, is there an effect of abortion on crime? Of course, we all know, well, we all at least are willing to believe that maybe abortion rates are not randomly assigned. Okay, so what we'd like to do is come up with a story where we think that the variation in abortion, conditional on stuff, can be taken as exogenous. All right. And like I said, I'm going to just adopt the formulation from the um, Levitt and Donahue paper. So I believe, because they did, that if I were able to condition on the right set of state level characteristics, abortion rates could be taken as randomly assigned relative to crime, relative to the unobservables driving crime. Okay? Now, again, I think when you're thinking about these high dimensional methods, it's important to keep in mind what the sources of endogeneity might be because you can't control for everything. Okay, so what are the key things that might be driving endogeneity here? The big one is, of course, states are just different for lots of reasons. And most of these reasons we don't observe. All right, it may well be the case that crime rates in different states evolve differently than crime rates in other states. Abortion rates in different states evolve differently than abortion rates in other states. Those two evolution patterns are related to each other. But they're related to each other only because there is some other unobserved state-specific characteristic that's driving those two patterns. Um, if Matt Taddy were here, he would throw out one example which he gave to me, which is a cell phone usage. So if you actually go out and plot these things, cell phone usage patterns look a lot like abortion rates in that they start off near zero for a long time, and then cell phones get invented, but they kind of suck for a while, so they tick up a little bit. And then they get good, and they jump up, and then they kind of level off. Everybody has a cell phone. Okay? If you think about, if you actually go and plot abortion rates, that's kind of what abortion rates look like. So there's one unobserved factor that seems like it might be related to abortion rates and could be related to crime rates in that maybe as people get more access to cell phones, they call the police more, and that relates to lower crime. You know, I don't know. That's a story. So what are we worried about then? We're worried about things that are different across states that may be related to the evolution of abortion rates and the evolution of crime rates. Those are the key stories of con key sources of confounds that I'm worried about. If you sit down and think about your favorite stories for confounds in this example, most of them will fit in the category of unobserved state-specific stuff that might be related to crime rate evolutions and abortion rate evolutions. So there's our, there's our world. That's what we're worried about. Okay. So the Donahue-Levitt baseline model is the baseline model I think everyone would estimate in this scenario. It's a differences in differences or fixed effect style specification. We have the crime rate on the left-hand side. We have the abortion rate on the right-hand side. That's the variable of interest. One variable again. We want to learn the effect of abortion on crime. We're worried that we need to control for stuff. All right. We control for a set of time-varying state-level variables. Oh, those are mentioned in the slides below. Okay, I'm not going to talk. Well, I'll talk briefly about those in a second. Importantly, as we all know, we control for aggregate time effects. We control for aggregate state effects. And then there's some leftover stuff that we're hoping is unrelated to abortion rates and crime rates. Okay, sorry, to abortion rates. Um, all right, so obviously the state effects and time effects are meant to capture these aggregate stories I talked about, cell phone usage, or whatever it is. Okay, whether they do that, we'll, we'll maybe talk about that in a second. That's what they're meant to do. Okay, these other variables are hopefully going to soak up additional variation, which is either important for getting a more precise estimate or is related to this confound story that we're worried about. If you look at this set of um, characteristics, most of these look like things that are more useful for soaking up residual variation than actually addressing the endogeneity concern, um, in my opinion, in that most of them are things like the current or the crime rate last year, sorry, the number of policemen last year, as opposed to the number of policemen 18 years ago or something. But we can argue about that. It doesn't really matter. Those are the variables that Donahue and Levitt use. You can see them up there. Okay. 
So here are some baseline results. The first column, the one that says DL table four, is directly copied from the Donahue Levitt paper. There's no estimation of mine at all going on at that stage. Um, just so you know what that is, that is not exactly fixed effects. That is a GLS version of fixed effects. They use vanilla GLS standard errors when they report those standard errors. Okay, um, for you know, we could talk about that some other time, but that's what those are. Okay, the second column are estimates obtained by me. Those are just running first differences of the specification on the previous slide. First differences to remove the fixed effects, and because I happen to prefer first differences to fixed effects, but that's again a topic for another day. All right, um, the thing I want you to get from this is you would probably reject a specification test that these coefficients are the same. Um, economically, you're getting the same story. Okay, and so I'm going to work with the first differences from now on because that's what I like. All right, um, okay, so interpreting these things as causal in either event relies on the belief that whatever is driving, or sorry, any omitted variable that is related to both the evolution of crime rates and the evolution of abortion rates is perfectly captured, at least in, to the extent it correlates to these two things, by an average difference between states and an aggregate time trend. Okay, so we're not allowing for the fact that maybe there's something that's specific to California that means the trend in California relates to some unobservable in California, and that relates to differential trends in California um, as opposed to Arizona. All right, four reasons that aren't observed. Um, those of you who do diff and diff or this style analysis would probably say, oh, well, let's go out and throw in state-specific linear time trends. Shouldn't that soak up that maybe there's an additional state-specific trend we need to control for? Um, Donahue and Levitt do that. That adds an additional 50 variables. I don't report the results here. Again, I don't for a variety of reasons. Um, importantly, when you control for states for the time trends, you can't learn anything in this data, okay, which might be an indication that you should worry. But um, more importantly, relative to what they say, is that's a lot of degrees of freedom. That's very, very flexible. Maybe that's overkill. Maybe we don't actually want to control for state-specific time trends. Maybe we want to be a little more parsimonious than that. Okay, so again, for better or worse, that's the, that's the starting point. Okay, now what do I want to do? Again, I'm worried about unobserved factors that are related to evolution of crime rates and evolution of abortion rates. I can model that as an arbitrarily flexible trend, which is what I've done up here. You clearly, hopefully, you recognize you could not estimate the quote-unquote model on the board here. Okay, what that model says is that the outcome at time t is a function of all the possible values of all the regressors, state, and time, and that that function can differ arbitrarily across every state and in every time period. The only way to estimate this thing would be to put in a state cross time fixed effect, um, which we all know would absorb all the degrees of freedom. So we couldn't learn about this. Okay? And of course, my model then says I have the same sort of structure. Maybe it's a different function, but I have the same structure for abortion rates. Okay, so I'm worried that there's a correlation between this unobserved latent trend, which I've called G, and this unobserved latent trend, which I've called M. All right? Now, as I said, if I'm worried about these things being arbitrarily flexible, I can't learn anything, I might believe I could learn something from this data. So rather than be arbitrarily flexible, let's impose some parsimony. We're going to do that via dimension reduction. All right, so. What is our baseline? Our baseline says that functional form G is the linear function plus fixed effects for state and time that I just mentioned. Okay, that's a nice baseline. All right. Um, let's see, what else do I have on here? Oh, the other thing, which just to go back to the theme, in terms of intuitive dimension reduction, okay, this is the baseline, the intuitive dimension reduction Levitt and Donahue used. So one is a functional form assumption. The other intuitive dimension reduction they used is they said of all the possible macro, state level macro series that you could see, eight of them are the ones we care about. And those eight happen to be the ones that showed up in their model. Why those eight show up, again, that's, I assume there's a really good, actually I shouldn't say that. If you look at those eight, they actually make a lot of sense. So that's where they come from. But maybe there are other ones out there. Okay. Um, 
again, because I am too lazy to collect my own data, because I'm largely an econometrician, I'm going to pretend that those are the right eight <laughs> variables. Okay? In principle, you could think about doing variable selection, allowing for more state level macro series to actually be part of the model. I'm not going to do that. Okay? Now, what I care a lot about are these trends. Because in my mind, and maybe not in your minds, but in my mind, the possibility of correlated trends is the thing that I think is most likely to be driving an endogeneity story here that's not just absorbed by a fixed effect. All right? So I'm going to go out and I'm going to try to do a good job modeling these trends. All right? So here's my model, quote unquote model. Okay? I've already done the approximation of those trends by linear functions. So if you're wondering where. M and G went, M and G are now WIT prime pi 1 plus gamma t and WIT prime pi 2 plus kappa t. Okay? So those are my trends. All right. If my WITs were the differences in the original XITs, this is exactly the first difference specification I already estimated. Okay? Now, importantly, I think time effects are actually important. I think there might be a macro trend, so I'm not going to do any variable selection over that. I'm going to put the macro trend in every model. Okay? This goes back to the question that was asked, do I, you know, do I have to do selection over everything or can I add additional stuff? The answer is as long as the additional stuff is not huge dimensional, sure. In this case, the additional stuff is like 10 additional dummy variables. That's not huge dimensional. I'm just going to put the 10 dummies in. All right. The other thing I'm doing, I'm taking first differences. I'm saying, you know what, I know state-specific differences are important. So I'm just allowing all those fixed effects to be in the model. They're all in there because I've differenced them out. Now what I want to ask is there are other features of this trend, maybe nonlinear features of the trend, that I didn't account for with this specification. Um, all right. As an aside and part of my soapbox here, uh, you know, given that I do have a soapbox for a second. Linear trends for lots of things might be reasonable approximations, but they're kind of silly. Okay. What's a linear trend in crime, for example, saying over a period of 13 years? It's saying crime rates are increasing over 13 years or decreasing over 13 years. Do I actually think that, first of all, that can't possibly be a global approximation. Crime rates do not linearly blow up. And it's not even quest it's questionable whether that's even a good local approximation. So what I want to do is allow for something more general than a linear trend. I want to allow for maybe the fact that crime rates might go up and taper off, or they might do something wiggly. Okay? At the same time, I don't want a fully flexible nonlinear trend because that absorbs everything. So what am I going to do? I'm going to specify a flexible nonlinear trend and use variable selection to tell me are there important pieces to this flexible nonlinear trend that I missed when I just had level differences and a single macro trend. All right, so what are the variables I'm searching over? I have my eight original controls and differences. I have initial conditions in all of the controls in the abortion rate. I actually don't have the initial condition in the crime rate. I should cross that one off the slide. I didn't put the initial condition in crime in. Okay, so I just have the initial conditions of stuff that shows up on the right-hand side of that equation. I could put in the additional condition in crime, but whatever. I didn't. That's, that's a typo. All right. I also have within state averages of all the controls, within state average of the abortion rate. I have t and t squared. That's allowing for some sort of nonlinear trend. All right. And then the important part is I'm interacting all of those variables in one through three. Importantly, the initial conditions with t and t squared. Okay, so what is this model doing if you went back to levels? This is a model with a flexible cubic trend. Okay, so if you integrate this back from differences to levels, it's a model with flexible cubic trend where the way the trend evolves can depend on, say, the initial abortion rate. So maybe states that had initial low abortion rates might have had trends that were different for a variety of reasons that we don't observe, and maybe that's actually important. Okay, so that's my justification for where this set of variables came from. Again, it's being driven by me as the researcher, and you can disagree with me, but by me as the researcher sitting down saying, where do I think omitted variables bias is going to be coming from? How can I construct functions that will kind of capture those important features of omitted variables bias? So my idea here is I want a nice 
nonlinear trend to capture the fact that crime rates might not blow up and abortion rates probably don't blow up either. Okay, to approximate this relationship over a period of 13 years. All right, so when I put all these variables in, I have 284 variables, 576 controls. Or sorry, other way around. 280, not other way around, I used the same word twice. 284 variables, 576 observations. All right, now if I want to, I can actually run the regression of outcomes on everything here. You know, I've got enough degrees of freedom I can do that. Um, here are the results. These results shouldn't surprise anyone. If I have 576 variable observations and I think I need 300 controls, it's going to be really hard to learn anything. Okay? So there are my estimated effects. The estimated standard errors roughly say the effect of abortion is between absurdly large and absurdly small. Okay? So, you know, that's probably true. The effect of abortion probably is somewhere between so big it's implausible and so negative it's implausible. But we might think we could do better than that. All right? So, Probably what's going on is we've got a lot of these 284 variables that aren't actually important. Okay? What assumption says that? That's the approximate sparsity assumption. I don't actually need a really, really flexible third order trend that varies arbitrarily across all these individual characteristics to capture the important features of this data. Okay? So I'm going to do variable selection. All right? I'm going to choose variables again using lasso, using either tenfold cross validation or the plug-in value. I'm going to use penalty loathings estimated via the iterative procedure. Okay, so here in the abortion equation, oh sorry, there are three crime outcomes that you saw in the previous slides. I'm going to break that out, violent crime, murder, and property crime when I show the results. Um, the results are kind of are the same when you look at them. All right, so in the abortion equation, this is the variable to predict the right-hand side variable of interest given the plausible controls. We choose the same number of variables, 11, with the same identities, whether we use cross-validation or the plug-in method. Those variables are up here. Okay. Um, some of the variables like lag prisoners, lag police, lag unemployment, those are the things that showed up in Levitt's model. Okay. Others of these variables I think are more interesting. There's a nonlinear trend that seems to actually be really important here. Okay, so what do we have? We have income times time. We have beer consumption times time. We have income times time. We have the initial abortion rate. Okay, if you integrate all that up, that's a quadratic trend that depends on some of these initial state level characteristics. All right, and importantly, the initial abortion rate. Okay, so for whatever reason, these things seem like they do a good job predicting abortion. All right. We actually do get slight differences for cross-validation versus plug-in when we look at the crime equation itself. So when you use cross-validation, you select no variables. In the crime equation, we select two variables. Okay, those two variables, again, correspond to a nonlinear trend. So there's some sort of quadratic trend going on there. All right, um, I'm going to fly. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Um, you can do the same thing for property crime. The same sets of variables are chosen. Um, in this case, I. Yeah. This is the biggest difference between cross-validation and the plug-in estimates is in this equation. Um, we'll see what that does to the results in just a second. Um, the sets of variables, though, correspond again to what appears to be a nonlinear trend that interacts with a baseline state-level characteristics. All right, and then murder rate, we get the same sort of things. Okay, so here's the result. Okay, this is just the full table of everything. Um, I want to focus on the last two rows at this point. So post DS CV is the double selection method, selecting over this flexible trend using the cross validated penalty level. Um, post DS plugin is the double selection method using the plugin penalty level. Um, said in no case do we select exactly the same variables in both equations. In most cases, they're similar. The point estimates are, except for violent crime, very, very similar. Okay. Um, for violent crime, the stories are the same, although, again, you might reject that the coefficients are the same here. Um, the standard errors are big. Okay. Now, um, some comments about this. So first of all, the results we're getting are, I would argue, economically different from the results using just your intuition to choose the variables, saying, you know, everything's captured by the level and the aggregate trend. All right, the point estimates are similar. The standard errors are way bigger. 
All right. What's that telling us? It's telling us that if we allowed for the fact that there might be a nonlinear trend that depends on initial characteristics, okay, so maybe California trends differently from Arizona for unobserved reasons that happen to be related to whatever was happening in California in 1987, okay, then we can't tell whether the abortion rate is what's causing crime to change or whether it's this other unobserved thing that's out there that's just these trends. We can't tell, okay? So point estimates of the same standard errors are big enough that we would probably draw different conclusions. I would draw different conclusions. I would draw the conclusion that I can't tell what's going on here. There is no strong evidence that if I think states might be different based on unobserved trends, that I can distinguish the effect of abortion from crime, or sorry, the effect of abortion from those latent trends, okay? Um, now, in terms of, I think, sanity checks for myself, Foot and Guts in a couple of papers, but I've cited the 2008 one, make the identical criticism, or con I shouldn't say criticism, raise the identical concern based on economic arguments and noting that if you control for the crime rate before abortion could have had any impact, so if you just put in the initial level of crime in like 1970, that the abortion coefficient becomes indistinguishable from zero. If you look at what we're doing, that's actually the same conclusion we're drawing. We can't tell what the abortion coefficient is, whether it's zero or not, once we allow for trends that change depending on initial conditions. All right? So I like, you know, again, for me, I like the fact that an actual economist who thought carefully about the problem raised the same concern. Okay, we get the same sort of gee, maybe you should worry about unobserved state trends concern through a data mining technique, you know, which maybe should, maybe shouldn't, but that should complement the way we think about these economic analyses, I think. Okay, the other thing, all right, um, to note, in terms of what's going on, all of the action is in the abortion equation. Okay, so if you look back, say, at the murder rate, we're choosing these variables in the abortion equation. We're not choosing anything in the crime equation. Um, that's almost true in the property equation. That's almost true in the violent, violent crime equation. Okay, so if I really wanted to believe, say, the first difference row, maybe I could. Okay, what would I need to believe? I would need to believe that the coefficients on all these variables that were selected in the abortion rate equation are identically zero. Maybe they are, I don't know. Maybe those coefficients in the crime equation are identically equal to zero, so there's no omitted variables bias if I just drop them from the model. And in that case, the fact that I chose some variables that forecast abortion doesn't matter in terms of drawing my conclusion. Um, we can argue about whether that's true or not. Okay, what we're doing with this double selection procedure is guarding against the fact that maybe abortion is well predicted by a trend times the initial condition in abortion. And maybe that actually has some small amount of predictive power for crime rates. Okay, if that's true, we need to control, for the reasons Victor talked about, for that variable. Once we control for that variable, again, we can't tell whether the abortion rate, or sorry, this coefficient, estimated coefficient is being driven by the Levitt-Donahue story or whether it's some other unobserved state-specific trend factor. All right, um, so, you know, I could, I will stop belaboring that point and move on to the next example. Um, let's see, how long do they have, sorry? I have 30 minutes left, okay. All right, so, ne next two examples um, I think are a little bit shorter. Okay, so, Example three is the Ashemoglu Johnson Robinson paper that looks at the effect of institutions on um, growth. All right. So the baseline equation we think we have GDP per capita depends on some measure of institutions, which we've chosen to measure as protection from expropriation risk, and then maybe some other stuff. Okay, that's my xi beta. All right, there's a clear story for endogeneity here. So we might think that better institutions lead to higher incomes. That seems to make sense. But it also seems to make sense that places that have higher incomes may actually cause having them have better 
institutions. You've got more money, you've got more time to devote to developing good legal systems, whatever. And so there's a reverse causality question. All right, so what we want to do is do something to account for that possible simultaneity. We're going to use the same IV strategy as um, AJR. All right, um, one thing that you'll see in just a second, but the reason I picked this example, this is a nice example, it's very simple. It doesn't identically fit into either of the frameworks Victor talked about, but it's super close. Okay, in particular, it's going to be exactly that framework, but we're going to use three equations instead of two equations. All right, so with that set up, all right, what are we going to do? We need an instrument. The instrument we're going to use is the instrument um, AJR chose, which is settler mortality, European settler mortality, the earliest available, available estimate of that number. Okay, and that's just drawn exactly from their paper. All right, so why should this work? Their argument is in the first stage. Well, settlers are going to set up better institutions in places that they might want to live, i.e. where they aren't going to die. And as such, if settler mortality was high someplace, they should have bad institutions because the Europeans didn't want to stay there. All right, and then there's the argument that institutions are really persistent. So once something gets set up, it's hard to get rid of it. All right, um, that's their baseline argument. We're going to buy that. Okay. Second bit is why this is excludable. The exclusion restriction comes from the fact that GDP, it's pretty persistent. But it's less persistent than institutions. In particular, GDP you know, right now is probably far less influenced than thing, by things that you know, determine, say, the development of institutions hundreds of years ago than by other just idiosyncratic stuff. So whatever happened in 1500 should be unrelated to GDP right now, except through the channel of the institutions that were established in 1500. Okay, so that's the argument. You know, it's a, I think it's a clever argument. We're going to live with that. All right, now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm killing our cameraman. Um, okay, so the, um, I lost my train of thought. Okay, all right, so the problem with this story, and. Um, AJR recognized this, there may be other problems, but the one they worry about is, of course, there are other persistent factors that might be related to both GDP and institutions. And the story they're really worried about is um, geographic determinism, which is this notion that it's geography. GDP is just a function of geography. Geography is, of course, highly persistent. Um, it rarely changes. And, you know, if geography is what's driving uh, uh, GDP growth, it's probably related both to the institutions and to GDP, and we need to control for that. Okay, so we want to control for geography, all right, and then use variation in these mortality, in this mortality variable that is not related to geography. Okay, and that's going to be the identification that we're going to rely on to try to separate these stories out. All right, um, so the baseline AJR results control linearly for latitude. It's a sensible idea. Okay, so just however far you are from the equator, but I should be clear, latitude here is normalized to be between 0 and 1, and it's distance from the equator. So it's always positive. It's between 0 and 1. All right, they're going to control linearly for latitude. They also do a bunch of specification stuff where they include interactions, they include continent dummies and other things. All right, and um, again, as the econometrician, when I look at some of their robustness checks, I get a little worried because the first stages start to get really weak when you control for some of these other functions of geography. All right, so maybe we, it's hard to learn about the effect of institutions when you try to fix geography. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but one might worry. Okay, so rather than try to control for everything, let's hope that there might be a parsimonious function of geography that we can use. All right, um, again, to fix ideas, to give us some numbers to talk about, or for me to talk about, there, Baseline estimates which control linearly for latitude, you have a pretty decent first stage, so the coefficient is around minus 0.5, standard error is about 0.15, so your um, T stat is whatever, three ish, and your F stat's around nine, so you know, that's borderline weak instruments using the usual rules of thumb, but let's say that's good. Okay? And then the estimated effect of institutions on GDP is a big number. Okay, so if you look at the units, and these are all log, anyway, 0.96 with a pretty big standard error, that's a big number. It looks like institutions are pretty important. All right, so I want to do the same thing. 
I want to allow ourselves to control flexibly for geography, but I don't want to limit myself and say, I know the way to control for geography is by latitude, linearly. Okay, so let's, maybe it's something more complicated. It's not, actually not going to be. That's maybe a theme that comes out too. But. All right, so let's at least worry about that and you know, think about what's going on. So we have three equations now. All right, first equation is the structural equation of interest where we have GDP as a function of institutions and geography. X here is geography, D is institutions. We have a first stage equation. First stage says institutions are a function of mortality and geography. Okay, we have a third equation. What's that third equation? This is the reason we have to control for geography. Third equation says mortality is a function of geography. If mortality were not a function of geography, then we wouldn't need to control for geography. We'd just run IV using um, mortality and go home. So we now have three equations. They're very simple equations, but that's the framework we're in. Okay, and our belief is that if we were able to put enough stuff about geography in that vector x, the instrument would be a valid instrument. Okay, so what do we do? We take the system of three equations and turn them into reduced forms. Why are we doing that? We can use variable selection methods to learn about reduced form relationships. We then have our structure. We can figure out what that means about the structure. All right, so our three reduced forms, we have the regression of GDP on geography. We have the regression of institutions on geography. We have the regression of mortality on geography. All right, how are we going to work this? We're going to do three variable selection steps. We're going to take the union of the variables chosen in each of those selection steps, use those as controls when we run our IV. Pretty simple. All right, so. Here we go. My choice, again, I didn't state this because it's hopefully implicit by now. I'm using lasso. I'm doing two versions of penalty selection. And I'm using iterative methods to allow for heteroscedasticity in, the, uh, in those penalty loadings. I need a flexible function over geography because that's what I'm worried about. Um, I could try something more flexible. But given that I only have 60 some odd observations here, my flexible function over geography is pretty simple still. Okay, I have continent dummies. I have a cubic spline in latitude. Okay, so there's my set of things that might be driving the results. Okay, again, the number of variables, if you count them here, is smaller than the number of observations. I can run this just throwing everything in. And if I do that, I end up with no first stage. So my first stage point estimate is minus 0.21. My first stage standard error is positive 0.22. Any sensible rule of thumb would say that probably isn't going to work. And we can, of course, construct the IV estimator. Um, even if you took the IV estimator at face value, you would probably conclude you can't learn anything here. Um, again, if you take that standard error of 0.7, multiply that by 2, that says the effect of institutions on GDP is between like minus 600% and positive 900% or something like that, um, which it probably is again, but. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't it actually say that the, um, the effect that flows directly from the institution? Yeah, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Remember, that's what our goal here is. We want to know what is the causal effect of institutions. Oh, sorry, thank you. Restate the question. So the question was, isn't this telling us um, what, the, what we can learn about the effect of institutions not mediated by geography? And the answer is exactly. That is exactly what this is telling us. And that's the causal question of interest to us. We would like to be able to actually say, no, this is due to institutions. All right. We don't want to be able to say, well, here's an effect, and this effect could be institutions or it could just be geography. We want to actually be able to say, no, good institutions actually are good. Okay? And we can't do that unless we mediate or get rid of the effect of geography. Now, it might be impossible to learn about the effect of institutions getting rid of the effect of geography, because maybe institutions are so highly correlated with geography, this is just an impossible thing to decompose. Um, that might be the case. That's one way to interpret these results. But the goal is to try to disentangle those two effects. Okay? And if that's not your goal, then of course you would do something else. And that's a fair question. But yes, that is the goal of their paper, uh, stated in their paper anyway. And so as such, that's the goal of my toy example here. All right. Um, okay. So anyway, you know, that looks like 
either we're over controlling for things or we can't learn about the effect of institutions once we control for geography. Okay. How might we try to get a handle on this? We might try to ask, well, do we actually need to control for this pretty flexible function of geography? All right. Um, so again, same sort of deal. We do lasso. We choose variables in these three equations. Um, once again, you get identical variables regardless of which method of choosing the lasso penalty parameter you use. Um, only one variable pops out in all three of the equations. It is the same variable which is nice in that it means we only have to control for one thing. Um, and all of you who look at this will probably say, well, of course, that's the main variable. Um, the variable that pops out is Africa. So once you control for Africa, it looks like the rest of the stuff going on in geography, you can't tell whether there's any predictive power left over. OK, so whatever's driving geography is Africa. All right, so let's go out and control for Africa. All right, here are our results, the three sets of results again. Um, all right, as you can see, the first stage coefficient is similar. It's a little bit attenuated, not attenuated, sorry, the standard error is a little bit bigger than when you control just for latitude, but they're in the same ballpark. Um, the coefficient estimate is attenuated. The standard error is a little bit smaller. Uh, you know, this is, I say things on camera that I probably shouldn't say. Um, Given that the initial estimated effect was implausibly large, it's nice that this estimated effect is slightly smaller. It's probably still implausibly large. Um, but you know, it looks like if we're willing to buy the sparsity, which we might, may or may not be willing to buy, but if we're willing to buy the sparsity in that there may be a complicated uh, you know, relationship between GDP and all these other variables and geography, but that complicated effect is well approximated by some small number of the things I've written down up here. We're going to tell almost exactly the same story as the original Ashimon, Gu, Johnson, and Robinson paper. We're not going to change our fundamental economic story very much. Institutions appear to matter even after you take out the sort of main geographic factor. All right. Um, and then the final example that I want to talk about is a straight up many instrument IV example. All right. Um, as Victor said, this is probably the simplest application of variable selection things to the sorts of things economists might want to do. Okay. In this case, what we want to do is um, try to estimate the consequences of eminent domain on some economically interesting outcome. Um, eminent domain is the, if you don't know, it's just the jargon for when the government seizes private property. So the government says, we want your property to build a highway or whatever. And because we're the government, we can take it. Um, and they do. And then maybe they compensate you. That's something else. All right, so we want to see, is the threat or is the exercise of eminent domain related to some sort of economic outcome? All right. And in our case, um, we're going to measure that by judicial decisions related to eminent domain. Okay, so we're going to, well, I think I've, oh, I don't have this written down here, but I'll talk about it. Okay, so in terms of the outcome, there are a variety of things you could look at. This is in the IV paper with Victor, um, Daniel Chen, and Alex Bologna. This is sort of the main example. We're just going to look at one little piece from that where we're going to look at the Case-Shiller price index as the economic outcome of interest. Okay, maybe there are other things, but let's look at the effect on, say, house prices. The way we're going to measure eminent domain is we're going to measure the number of times that a circuit court decides in favor of um, individuals. So in other words, where the circuit court comes along and says, you know what, uh, when the government seized your property, that was illegal. They shouldn't have seized your property. We're going to either give it back or compensate you in some way. All right. Um, so that's going to be the way we measure the exercise of eminent domain. We can argue about that, but that's our measurement. Okay. Um, and of course, whether or not circuit courts decide in favor of property owner, of individual property owners, is not randomly assigned, okay, or may not be randomly assigned. Okay, so maybe they're looking at housing markets or economic conditions or other things when they're deciding how to decide these cases about whether government seizures were lawful or not. All right, so we're worried a little about endogeneity. And the way we're going to get around that in this example is to note that um, 
judges are assigned in the circuit court, which is why we're using the circuit court. Um, you know, it may not be the most direct thing you would care to measure, but it gives us a nice identification strategy. So judges in the circuit court are assigned randomly. Okay, so whatever judges hear your case when you go to a circuit course is a random, you know, that's a random decision made by, I don't know what, hopefully a computer, but some random mechanism decides which judges are going to sit in on the case. All right. Um, and roughly what that means is that the demographics or any other characteristics of the panel of judges that sit on your case is an instrument for the way the judges decide the case. Okay, so since the judges were randomly assigned to the case, their characteristics are, of course, also randomly assigned to the case. Since the judge was randomly assigned, his characteristics were randomly assigned. And then those characteristics can be used as instruments to guess whether the verdict was for you or against you. All right, so that's the basic set of the argument. All right, the problem is that, um, or the econometric problem is that we have three judge panels deciding circuit court cases. We observe all kinds of characteristics of the judges on three judge panels. And so that actually gives us a huge set of potential instruments. So any combination of the demographic characteristics of the set of three judges that sit on your case is a potential instrument to be used to predict whether the case went for or against you. All right. And um, as you might maybe believe, uh, some of these characteristics may be more useful than others for actually figuring out the way judges decide cases. All right. So maybe we don't want to just use all possible combinations of characteristics of three judge panels. In fact, that's impossible given the sample sizes. But we might think about choosing variables that are really useful for predicting the way judges decide cases. All right, so um, there are a few ways we could do this. One approach you could take is, again, to use intuition. So this is a straw man, but we all like straw men. So um, something that comes out of the judicial literature is judges' political affiliation can often be used to decide to figure out the way they decide cases. Um, one might hypothesize that Democrats, for example, um, they're more pro-government in some sense. They might be less likely to overturn a judge, or sorry, to overturn a taking decision and say no, that taking was illegal. And maybe Republicans like um, individual property rights more, and so they're more likely to overturn government seizures of private property. Maybe that's an intuitive story, and we're going to use that as the straw man. So. If you go out and you just say, all right, well, I'm going to use my intuition. I've got actually thousands of potential characteristics I could use. I'm going to choose one of them, which for in other cases looks like it predicts judges' um, decisions. I'm going to just use how many Democrats were on the panel. Okay. Um, if you look at that, there's no first stage. So it turns out for this particular setting that Knowing whether or not there were Democrats on the panel gives you very little explanatory power in decisions regarding eminent domain cases. Okay, uh, maybe not surprising, maybe it isn't, but that is what's in the data in this case. Okay, so, all right, that's not going to work. All right, rather than do that, let's just treat this as a big variable selection problem where we're going to try to choose characteristics of judges that forecast the way they choose they decide eminent domain cases. And there's the many instrument model up there, and I'm not going to worry too much about all that stuff. Um, we control for some stuff, and I'm not going to worry about that. All right, importantly, from my standpoint, um, we have 42 baseline variables about judge characteristics. All right, um, and that's already dimension reduced. So we had potentially more than 42 baseline characteristics, but we said here are 42 things we think might be useful for predicting judge decisions. Okay. For each of these characteristics, we know the number of panels that had one, two, or three members with these characteristics. So we have a bunch of counts that say zero, one, two, or three. All right. Um, and then, because you know that's actually probably plenty, and I could have stopped there, but because of the goal of this exercise, say, well, maybe linear stuff in those three variables isn't the right way to do it. Um, since all these things are counts of one, two, or three, we can just use cubics and throw in all cubics in all these variables and throw in a bunch of interactions. OK, why not? We can, in principle. Maybe there's something that pops out. Maybe not. All right, so what that gives us is a big set of variables. 
um, bigger than what I'm going to talk about. Um, one thing that I think um, both Jesse and Matt mentioned, as well as Matt Taddy, um, in many of these cases, you're going to want to do some pre-processing. So if you look at that big set of variables I just talked about constructing, lots of them look like, simply based on the characteristics of the instruments themselves, it's unlikely they're going to do anything. So we throw away any variable that has an average of less than 0 0.05. Okay? So if all these things were binary, that's saying anything that happens less than 5% of the time, we're just getting rid of that. We don't think the things that happen that rarely are going to have much predictive power. Maybe they do, but we're ex ante eliminating those things. All right? We're also eliminating any variable that has a standard deviation of less than 10 to the negative sixth. Okay, which, as you all might guess, is roughly saying we're eliminating anything that is perfectly predicted by a constant. So those are unlikely to actually have explanatory power. We might as well just, before we do any variable selection, get rid of all that stuff because it's just going to slow computation down and it's not going to help anyway. All right. Um, we also go through and manually remove some multicollinearity. So any variables that have pairwise correlation bigger than 0.99, I just arbitrarily drop one of them. And there is no rhyme or reason to which one I leave in. I just go through and the first one that shows up in the data set is the one that gets thrown out. Okay. Once you've done all of those selections, you get 147 instruments. All right. Um, in terms of the IV problem, and in terms of, you know, I think it's important to point out any method of choosing variables that doesn't look at Y, the outcome, or D, the endogenous variable, is fine. If I wanted to randomly choose instruments, I could do that. If I want to throw instruments away because I don't like how much variability they have, I can do that because I'm not cheating by looking at the data first. Okay, so all these ex ante eliminations are perfectly kosher and they're mainly done for to ease computation. There's no reason to carry around a bunch of stuff which is not going to help. All right, so with that, we've got our 147 instruments. We have 183 observations. We do the same deal we've been doing all along. When you don't do the selection, you choose just one variable of those 147. Um, it is perhaps not the most intuitive variable, but we might add the main effect and then it would be more intuitive. Um, the one variable you choose is having one or more members on the panel with their law degree from a public university squared. Okay. Um, if you actually go back and don't do all the interactions and stuff, you choose just the main effect of this variable, it turns out that the quadratic term actually has more explanatory than power than the main effect. All right, that's whatever it is. Um, all right, the intuition for that variable ex post, you can justify people who got their law degrees at public universities, maybe they're poorer, maybe they like private property more, and so that's why it loads up. You can ex post justify anything. The argument is, of course, based on the notion that all of these instruments were valid ex ante because they were all randomly assigned, and we just want to find some set of instruments with a lot of explanatory power. Okay? Relative to the baseline, we have a really strong first stage. So our T statistic here is about 9, so that's an F statistic of around 81, as opposed to the baseline straw man where the T statistic is 1 and the F statistic is therefore also 1. Okay, and we get a fairly precise, positive, but small effect of additional pro-plaintiff decisions on the Case-Shiller price index. Okay, and just to, the magnitude is maybe a little hard to interpret because I haven't given you any units of any kind, um, but it is a small effect, <laughs> all right? Um, and again, if you think about this variable as the variable, it's the number of decisions in favor of the plaintiff, which is a decision overturning a government seizure, or in other words, that's a decision in favor of private property rights. It seems like additional decisions in favor of private property rights are associated with higher home prices in the area where this is going on. Okay? And if we believe the random assignment story, we can take this as a causal effect. So you know, government exercise of these things seems to, sorry, Reinforcing private property rights seems to be associated to, you know, improvements or I shouldn't say improvement, appreciation in prices of private property. All right. Um, and that differs strongly from the straw man baseline. All right. Um, and I tried to push down, but that's obviously my last slide because it stopped. All right. So that means I'm done. Um, how am I? I got time for questions. Okay, so if there are any questions, if not, I would happily shut up.